you so much. Morning, Miss Belma. <laughs> yes, and for joining me on this recording this morning. We are going to go ahead and Let's jump start right here. away. Uh, can you please just introduce yourself to our audience, those who are coming on this for the first time, or those who are, who are just coming back to watch and see what God is saying? Okay, so my name is Chinyeruko Euphemia Adeli. Um, born Chinyeruko Euphemia Chiragorum, but married to Adeli. So Chinyeruko Euphemia Adeli, that's my name. Um, um, was born in Imo State, precisely Emekuku, where Imo State. I'm from Ngopala by birth. But I'm married to an Abekuta man, Mr. Damilonga Adeli. We got married in 1996. My colleague, I met along this way. We met as missionaries in Kapu and uh, got married. And uh, we're blessed today with three children, two grown men and a delectable teenage girl, Hadassah. So um, what else do I say? Yeah. Awesome. You did tell us that you're a PhD holder on missions. And... Uh, okay. <laughs> that too. <laughs> you don't you don't pick that, you don't just get that like that. <laughs> it's not, it's mm. not uh, you yeah. know, uh uh Bama, you know, the way I look at my life, um, there's one end, there's one purpose. Every other thing is a means to that end. Yeah. So that's why I'm very appreciative to God for the privilege of having a PhD from Asbury Theological Seminary. It was a very hard, very tough journey. At many points in that journey, I wondered why, you know. But, you know, the only thing that kept pushing me was that God told me to. And at one point when I was like, I don't need this. And God rebuked me and told me, I have no right to say I don't need what he says I need. And uh, so that's the, and I'm not in any way demeaning the PhD, you know, but that that's the context, you know. Yeah. And, and I think, I think it's just so um, uh, important. I can't forget the first, my first uh, sermon that Dr. Tennant preached, the uh, orientation, scholars on fire. Like that is, to me, that was just called cool because like having been a missionary, it's easy to like, well, maybe the education is not so important, but having been in the setting of scholarship, I know like there's a place that this is so important. It's really for someone when you've had the experience of a missionary and God has like said, hey, I want you to get this. There are some, there are some spaces, there are some assignments that will not step into without that preparation, so. I remember we had I remember we had, had that discussion earlier on in life, if you remember, that scholars yeah. on fire. And we were saying that you and I were talking and we were quite concerned that why is it that those who seem to have this, those who have this education seem cold. You know, their brains are full, but their hearts, you know, you can't feel the warmth. And why yeah. is it that those who like they have the warmth are empty you know they can't articulate it they can't that, that there's a disconnection isn't there going to be a time when those whose hearts are full also have their heads are also full isn't it part of the holistic ministry that yes. spirit soul and body is full do we have to sacrifice one for the other you know, we had had that conversation. And yeah, yeah. that's that was part of the motivation. And yeah. uh, at each point, I found out that, oh, I know this. Then I was now learning the, the how do I say? I was now learning, the, getting the knowledge the, behind the, the things that I, and the languages, yeah. the, behind the things that I had already practiced, that I had already known, you know. Yeah. So that's the way it was, it was like, okay, you've done most of the practical. Now, can you now know the theories behind mm. these practicals? Yeah. And so it, 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 it keeps you very grounded. It keeps yes. you very like, oh, really? You know, and yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, and we are going, and I think, especially for, for our African context, 
I'm a, we've had a lot of different people tell our stories. And I think it's important that our scholars start telling it. So we tell it the way from our perspective. It's different from when another person comes into a setting and learns and they tell our story. It's, I celebrate that. But I think when our own scholars start telling the story, it's it's a whole lot different. So. You know, uh, Velma, you're just getting into me this morning because <laughs> many times I will open those books to read and I'll just say, I say, but God, you know, this is not true. <laughs> I, I said, God, but you know, he said, yeah, yeah. That's why you have to sit down so yeah. you can tell us what is true, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, because, I mean, you don't blame anyone. When someone comes into your context and becomes a professional in three months, what does the person really know? Yeah. What does the person really know? But we are the ones who have created those gaps. Mm -hmm. We were born there. We, we got saved there. We did ministry there. But we have no stories to tell. Yes. And yeah. so someone comes from outside and stays there three months and feels that, oh, I can tell this story. And we clap for the person, <laughs> you know. I have been here now in Dayton, Ohio, since August. And I'm supposed to do a research. Mm -hmm. Do you know what has been keeping me back? It's not that I couldn't have finished the research before December. It's, I respect context. Yes. I respect the background stories. So now I am registering for a course on Dayton. So I can actually have a grip of the yeah. people that I want to write about. Yeah. I think it's disrespectful just coming from up in three months, you just say, and it's supposed to be authoritative. No, <laughs> it can never be. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God will help us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've written for you. Yes. Let's do this. So tell us a little about your call to ministry and what you're doing presently. Mm -hmm. That's a long story. I really don't know if you are, <laughs> if you are <laughs> ready for it. So there are so many things that I must say to be able to articulate my call. Mm -hmm. uh, first and foremost, is that I was born the first of, uh, in, into a middle-class home in the east of Nigeria. And uh, my parents were some of the first in their communities to get the Western education. So, and uh, they got it with the help of Catholic, Irish Catholic missionaries. And, um, you know, missionaries looking for, you know, sharp chaps, you know, to invest in. And in their different communities, these two people, my mom and my dad, were these sharp brains, you know. And... Um, on their own, eventually they met under the canopy of um, the Catholic Church and they got married. So as you would expect, education and religion, Catholicism, were the gods in my home. I mean, mm. from waking up from everything I knew because um, education was what had distinguished my parents, made them, yeah. you know, lifted them up from society. It was everything to them. And it was through the Catholics. So mm. they they were, you know, they felt they had to, you know, be loyal yeah. to this group, you know. So I kind of became a guinea pig because... Um, I started school. I don't even remember formally starting school. Mm. You know, mom was a teacher. And so she would take me to school. And she she was she was a pro on primary one, primary one. Mm -hmm. So she took me to school and I just sat there and and just so that um you know, just so that I would not uh, disturb or she would give me a big black board. I still remember. <laughs> and I was just a baby and I would scribble things and all. So the examination in that year, just again, so that I don't disturb. Mm -hmm. So she gave me my own questions, exams and all. And, you know, I did it and she would be laughing she, and she'll be telling the students, you see this girl, she's getting it more than you. 
So she would also grade my paper and tell me what I made. So that evening, mm -hmm. I remember, she told my dad, I don't know what's happened, but it looks like this girl is understanding, yeah. you know. And my dad said, did anybody write it for her? I said, no. He said, she said, she's taught. He said, did anybody write? I said, no, she was just playing and just writing. But my father said, then why why waste her time? She has yeah. just done she has just done primary one. Wow. She has just done primary one. And my husband, my my dad said, pay back the school fees. And so they went and paid first, second, and third term. And oh, wow. I went I went to primary two. And then got to primary two, they were still watching, you know. Okay, maybe it's our mom. But then got to primary two, I was first all through, you know. Oh, and, wow. and the story continued like that. But why am I getting to this story? Because that's how I got into secondary school at nine years and into university at 14 years. Oh, wow. One, four. I went into the University of Nigeria in Soka. Now but I remember where your that, kids' genius is coming from. Oh no, don't even don't I don't <laughs> I don't I don't uh, count that as actually I don't know. I don't want to say it was an abuse, but that's what I think. <laughs> I didn't I didn't at the end of the day I really didn't like it because I hardly grew up with my mates. Mm. Okay. I I almost like had no childhood. If you ask the question in my house, they will tell you to go to the encyclopedia. So at the age of five, whatever, we're looking at encyclopedia. That was our, there was nothing. We didn't have, literally didn't have a life. It was book, book, book. So I went to University of Nigeria and Soka at 14. And my dad said to get a pre, a pre, a preliminary because that he couldn't send me to Russia then to study medicine at 14. So he said, okay, go to the university here in Nigeria. And at 18, you'll be finishing. Then you'll be ripe enough to leave the country. <laughs> Do you see my story? <laughs> so, well, before then, I had, when I was in school, how old was I? Maybe 10, 11. I had fallen in love with Jesus. I had, but my father sat me on his laps and talked to me and told me why born again thing was for those who didn't have a future, not for somebody like me. And you see, that whole thing followed me from primary school, from college, all the, from secondary school. All the people that knew me knew me for one thing: I was very small and I was, you know, very celebra. You know, so. That everywhere today, even if you posted this online, those who know my story, that is all. That's all Chiyan Gochiagoram is known for. So my father sat me down and talked to me. But remember that my father knows all things, was respected, was highly placed. So who am I? So it just means that I missed it. But I knew that I had a dream. I saw Jesus. I, I knew. I knew that I encountered but Daddy said, that's not the way to go. So, you know, that's not the way to go. And again, I don't blame them. But I also was like, when we gave our life to cry, what were we told to do? Okay, don't rub powder. Don't, you know. <laughs> so when daddy said, that's not the way to go, well, I wasn't grounded enough to say no. Yeah. So, so I went to the university at 14. You know, University of Nigeria and Soka. Who knew my age? Who knew how old I was? I went in in 1979. You can calculate back, and it was it was quite it was it was quite traumatic. It wasn't it wasn't mm. easy for me. So yeah. natural intelligence couldn't do it for me. Um, and I I read chemistry, zoology, combined honors. So sometimes I had three classes going on at the same time. And I would choose not to attend any. So I was playing. I really didn't have, I was there. I, I, I was a 14 year old child. Yeah. I was also very extrovertish, you know. So, but then natural intelligence did some. I tried, I struggled, I, you know. 
But at the end of my four years, I failed the degree exam. And I was 18. It had never happened to me. How can Chiri go to and fail anything? It's not possible. But I failed. And I think that was the mercy of God. And uh, some people were praying for me. My life was really becoming chaotic, you know. It was just... So people were praying for me and I failed. And I came back and to to do degree. I remember telling people, I'm only 18, I'm not 81. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I still remember that very clearly. So I came back and I sat down and I read and I made up my mind. And I said, what nonsense, you know, of course, of course, of course, you know, I got through, but that was just a secondary thing that happened. The major thing that happened that year was that I was, I calmed down enough Mm. to receive Jesus as Lord. Amen. And I think that was the gift University of Nigeria and Soka gave me. Mm. That was the gift. I received Jesus as Lord. I fell in love with him. Still, I'm in love with him. It's just, it was just totally amazing. Well, of course, people said, oh, isn't it because she's repeating? Uh -huh. Her body has not come down. <laughs> oh, I'm so good. All over the place. Don't worry, when she graduates now, she'll find her level again. This one, she can never settle down. But that was in 1983. I've not settled mm. till now. Mm, <laughs> it keeps yeah. yeah, it keeps growing and growing. So it was that final year I gave my life to Christ that I began seeing um, dreams of myself as a missionary. Mm. And I didn't understand what it meant. Isn't it white people that are missionaries? So what's my business with a missionary? It's only white people that do such things, you know? So, but, well, that's, uh, that's, that's my story. I, you know, I, that's when I began to ask. And then there were people that followed me up. And they began to tell me, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. But eventually, I knew that God had separated me to bring the gospel to those who did not have the gospel. And my growth, my love for him began from that 1983 and Amen. continues to grow till today. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for sharing. That's amazing. So tell us a little, when you said yes to the missionary call, tell us about your missionary experience how uh, before coming to the U.S. Okay, so, you know, I would really have loved to say that straight from the campus there, I went on to be a missionary and all, but no, I walked after graduation. My dad was like, okay, time now to go to Russia. And I said, raw what? <laughs> oh, no, you know. So he was very upset. He disowned me, st long story short. But I worked as a teacher, which was very, very important, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually, after seven years of working, in 1990, 1990, 1991, I, I knew that God had called me to leave and I was still working. I was active in the church where I was, Living mm -hmm. Word Ministries in Abba. Yeah. That was okay. where I was. I was very active. I, by the grace of God, started, and I, you know, started the living youth aflame, you know. And I know that this is something that could, but that's the truth. Those are facts. Started the living youth aflame, and um, it's still on till today in the mm -hmm. ministries. And, uh, but then time came, and I knew that what God was calling me for wasn't just, you know, what I was already doing in church, the activity. I knew that God was calling me for something more, mm -hmm. you know, and he made it plain to me. And I joined Calvary Ministries Capro. Joined Capro and moved to the north of Nigeria to get my training and all. Then from getting my training, I moved on. The first, I had to learn the Hausa language. I think that's kind mm -hmm. of, you know, defined so many things for me. And uh, by the grace of God, I learned how to speak, how to write, how to read, how to talk in two and a half months. And it's wow. not, not, it's not like maybe, oh, you are smart. No, 
that was just a Holy Ghost. It was God. It was wow. almost like a miracle because while learning, I was laying hands on my tongue. Mm. I remember Brother Raymond Hassan, one of the missionaries there that I was working with, he told me, your tongue is too English. <laughs> you, you, you can't speak this thing. And he thought he was joking. I'll go back to my room. I'll remove my tongue. I'll lay hands. I say, tongue, tongue. You have to speak out, sir. This is what stands between me and what God has called me to do. You have to, you know. And, and everything was soaked and marinated in prayers. And in my desire, just loving the Lord, you know. Yeah. And I have a message in my heart. Uh, but how do I say it to, to these people? Because I was immersed. I was immersed in the field with them. There was mm -hmm. no other English speaker. So yeah. in two and a half months, I was able to, you know, do all that. And I, it, it was, wow. was a wonderful experience. So from then on, the leadership of Capro asked me to share. How did that happen? Just just like I'm sharing here now. Mm -hmm. After I had shared a couple of times, they asked me to start teaching cultural and language learning techniques mm -hmm. in Capro School of Missions, you know. And I taught it for over 17 years before coming to the US. But within that time too, remember that you just go like twice a year to teach this, you know. After yeah. I, became, I was a trainer, a full-time trainer. Then I move to other things. Then you come twice a year to teach and then you go back to where you were. So right. within those times too, um, we had moved to different places from, I had gotten married. We had moved from Mina to Port Harcourt. So I was also doing other things. Mm -hmm. One of those was uh, starting the Women in Missions, Women in Missions Ministries, Women in missions, that's what is just, you know, yeah. that is still on till today, you know. And uh, it's just uh, to motivate, you know, everyday women to be involved mm -hmm. in missions. Yeah. So we told them, brought women, other missionaries to tell them about missions. But we also took them to the fields to see. And it was a spark. It was a mm. spark. I mean, the, you can't see the, this truth. You can't see what God is doing and remain the same again. Yes. So women found their place in the work of God. You didn't have to be a missionary. You didn't have to just needed to be a child of God. So those that God had asked to give, it was they weren't doing me a favor. They knew they were doing themselves a favor. And yeah. those that God had called to do different things, they all got into it. And so it raised, it was a mass mobilization of everyday women, you know, mm. of the class, of the class that missionaries would just go to ask, you know, to donate yes. or to do things. Yeah. But, um, I didn't think that anyone should just be on the peripheries of what God is doing, just yeah. giving you a loose change. I, I feel that it's something that should consume you. You have to yes. find your own. I found my own, I found my own calling. I found my own niche. Mm. And I think every woman should find her own niche. Yeah. If the niche is given, you give it as unto the Lord, praying, going. And, you know, it's been how many years now? God has been so, God has been so faithful. That group still runs, even though I am now like an advisor. I'm now like, I am not a part, I'm not in the leadership. They have their, I mean, they've grown beyond me. I mean, that's the story. Yes. That, that kingdom work though, that when God uses us to start things and it goes bigger than us because he has a purpose and a plan. Uh, yeah. You know, you know, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Yes. And if it's not doing that, then it's not born of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just like um if 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 it's of you, it can go beyond you. But if it's of God, it doesn't even matter what happens, it just yes. keeps growing. And mm -hmm. when you know that something wonderful has happened, is when it's even like who started this? You know what I yes. mean? Yes. Who, who, uh, uh -huh. Like living youth aflame, living world ministries now. 
you know if they had yeah. this they would say oh really because the human being is but what god is doing is in the forefront and that's what has happened with women in missions you know for which i am just so glad you know so but my husband and i were also in port Harcourt. we are mobilizing resources we are involved in discipleship our home was like a discipleship hub most of those people now to the glory of god are married settled in their own homes and have, in fact, this, and have continued discipling. Amen. In fact, there's there's one of them. I, I told her that, uh, I said, she said, Auntie, I learned this from you. I said, no, you've gone beyond me, you know? <laughs> yes. I said, you've gone beyond me because, um, yeah, her home, oh, my world. She's involved in diaspora mich missions in Nigeria, with um with she and her husband they're reaching out to displaced northerners you know they speak wow. the Hausa language like they're drinking water they wow. i mean and when i see things like that i am very very i'm very very encouraged you yeah. know so and uh and and the uh in baggy field where i worked the first field where i worked I still, I'm still in touch with them till today. There are children who started their school in my bedroom. One of them is doing his PhD right now. He's a buggy native. Do you understand? And mm. those where I learned how to still in touch with them. One of them is a pharmacist today, you know. So, and they are growing in their own lives, but I am believing that they have kept Jesus at the center of their lives. Yeah. Thing you're talking i'm thinking like apostle that's that's our crown that's that's why we do this so that it's like at the end of the day we are able to bring people to the feet of jesus i like, know that's, i that's know and, that really matters and you know i am passionate about holistic ministry yes. you know so here is it's not just can you imagine first generation first generation literates wow are, are doing a phd there's nobody in their entire lineage that has had a school certificate before them, that has wow. gone to school before them, but they are doing a PhD now. Oh my. First Jesus, generation yeah. literates, you know, is a pharmacist today. I think, I think that's just the work of God. No yeah. one person can say, oh, it's me. No. No, mm -hmm. I mean, God may have used you to put in here, but this is God. Yeah. You know, and uh, so so it's not just that, oh, they are, they've become Christians and they've continued with the way of life of their parents, farming and all that. There are still some like that, but mm -hmm. that God has even scooped them yes. to, be, uh, to sit with princes. Mm. Wow, that's amazing and you're talking i don't you talked about living what missions in about do they have a branch in uh in uh obibo port harcourt do they have branches it's possible if this because is the I'm one thinking, i think i worked in the youth ministry in obibo that was living what ministries uh okay it could be because and i'm here and i'm glad it's on record most of the things i learned about spiritual gifts, all those things, you know, walking mm -hmm. in the spirit, walking in power was from Living Word Ministries. I attended the Bible school and it was just... Okay, I, it, now I see it is the same... Now I see why we are so connected. It's the same ministry that I grew up in, just a different name in Cameroon. Oh, what's the name of yours? Discipling the nations, but they are connected to Living Word Ministries. Ah, uh, okay. Youth ministry is called Youth of Flame. So before you talk about starting Youth of Flame, I was like, Youth of Flame? Yes, Living Youth of Flame, L-Y-A. Wow. This I is, just start. I'm surprised I, that we have not talked about this a lot. I just said, oh my God, we did, it was, it was amazing. We had an exciting we had an exciting, you know, youth. Like, you know, you know, I had graduated from university, but remember, I was still a teenager, you know. Yes. So, so you know, 
And, uh, you know, looking good, looking everything, but with Jesus at my center. So when you saw that, you know, fine girl walking around and you say, hello, can you? The next thing you hear is the full gospel. Oh, really, you? <laughs> <laughs> so it was such a shock, but it was an exciting time. I really, yes. I can't, I can't, and most of us today are mm. just there, just serving the Lord, just serving the Lord, doing great things, you know? Yeah. So it's 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 been a beautiful life. Can't trade oh, wow. it for anything. Yes, I really, really you know, that. using this opportunity to really say thanks to Living Youth, um, um, Living Word Ministries. It was a beautiful foundation for me. You know, and uh, you see, sometimes God brings you to a place. He nurtures you for the next thing, but yes. you become so invested. You become so invested in that place that you're, you're almost like i don't want to go but you know yes god, <laughs> when god finishes with you in a place he takes you to another yes. yep and if you don't want to go you begin to rock the boats <laughs> until you get out so yeah. so that's how it's been yeah oh my thank you so much i hope this video is blessing you and you're being challenged and encouraged uh, with regards to your call and your purpose Please like this video, share it with someone that you think would inspire, subscribe, leave us a comment, give us a feedback so we can be able to bless you better. We can be able to bring the right speakers to come. Let us know if you have any questions. And also here, before you, before you continue, uh, just look in the description below. There is a link to my book. It's the story of, I just told my story of what it means, like my call and my missionary experience, and I trust it's going to bless you. Okay, enjoy the video. Okay, let's switch a little. Tell me about what has it been like to be a missionary in America? Um, I will tell you this because uh, I will just tell you a little story. So I have this, you know, aunt of mine who really, really loves me, really, really loves the family, you know, and it's uh it's kind you know kind of proud of um, you know you are this you are that you know so she felt very disappointed with me that I became a missionary that I wasted my life look at this the smart girl that should have been something but you know so and she wasn't talking to me she was just upset with me you know that kind of thing so when I now came to America to study she sent a message to my mother that how can I be in America? And I will not tell her. Huh. I said, uh, uh, you know, uh, for me, it was a, a little bit jolting, like, oh. So I said, my mom, why? She's, I've disappointed her. I'm still disappointing her, you know. Mm -hmm. So why does she, you know? So I, I kind of got to talk with her. She said, eh, hey, hey. It is now that your senses are right. <laughs> if this was what you were doing all along, we wouldn't have complained. I said, like what? She said, America is where you should have been all along. I said, but I'm still doing the same thing. I'm mm -hmm. still. So, and that's where I'm coming back to where you're saying that. Yeah. It's the same thing for me. Okay. This is where the call of God has taken me to. This is the same person who sat in Baggy Field, who sat in that mud house, mm -hmm. who um who cooked my food in open fire, who lay on that bamboo bed, who um went to fetch my water, you know, um um and put it on my head on the bucket and drew it from the well. This is the same girl. Mm. But it's just that the location is now different. But um, yeah, this is this is just part part of the work, part of my calling. This is mm -hmm. now my present posting. It's a different location, but the 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 end has not shifted. I don't mm -hmm. know if I'm making sense. Yes. Yeah. I suppose, suppose they have become all things to all men, so that I can reach them. God takes us to different places and we have to adapt. The major goal is reaching the lost, making disciples. That's amazing. So tell us a little, you've been, you were a missionary as a single woman 
as a single lady and then later got married as a missionary. Uh, tell us what was it like, the difference, and then also what would you say to single sisters and brothers who are afraid to like step out to the mission field because like, if I go to that village, how would I find him? Uh, how would I find him? <laughs> you know, like, I, I mean, you have no, I can only tell my own story, isn't it? So by the time I knew that God was calling me to be a missionary in in that way, you know, okay. living the east of Nigeria, going to the north. I can't remember. I was how old? Now well into my mid-20s, okay? And I was even engaged. Oh. Yeah, I was... No, the truth about it, Velma, is that it wasn't... I don't know how to put it now because this is, you know, without making it look... <laughs> Yeah, it, I don't know. Without making it look, I hope anybody who hears this will understand what I'm talking. I don't yes. remember. I don't remember a time before I got married that there was nobody who wanted to marry me. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So it was well, there was always that. But I didn't get. I got married at thirty one. Okay, mm. and the reason was that. I didn't want to get married for the sake of getting married. My life had been boiled down completely to one end. Mm. And that was Christ. And that was Jesus. And that is Jesus. You know, and that's all my life. So if marriage will help that, why not? Yeah. And I was very willing to give it up just so that I will hold Christ. And, and I'm not, <laughs> I'm not forming. That was the, that's the real truth. Yeah. So I was engaged to this person. Nice person. Nice, nice, nice. That That's probably the person I would have married if I didn't um, um, become a missionary, you know. But now the story, you know. So but when I realized that, this is God's call. I had always known and I had shared with this person. And he said he took his call to be a missionary. And I Ooh. thought we, I thought, oh, this is wonderful. So that um, end up, was in 91, I think. 91. 90, no, okay. you know, just something like that. Yeah. And now I, I realized that, oh, this thing is not in the future. Mm. <laughs> this journey is starting now. And I went to tell him, he was an engineer. And um, I told him, look, 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 look. He said, do you know what you're talking about? Do you know that this is a tough, tough life? <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, but we discussed, you know, we discussed. He said, she said, he said, eh, he knows that, hey, girl, let's get married. Have a few kids. And then we'll start. I said, oh, you say the tough, tough life for us. And you want us to bring in children from outside into this tough, tough mm -hmm. life. So at that point, I knew it wasn't going to work. Verma, did I cry? I wept buckets. Yeah, I bet. Did I? And then, because my whole family knew him, everybody knew him. Everybody thought I was going mad. And he now joined, he now joined with people, you know, trying to persuade me. But any my someone went to talk to my mom. My mom said, This girl, if she has said this is what she wants to do, she will. But anyway, to cut a really long story short, I I I, bro I broke that relationship. I didn't break it immediately before going, but when I got to to um, Joss, mm -hmm. you know, the Lord asked me to break the relation. I was whooping and crying and doing it. And then yeah. people now told me, you are mad. You are going to a bush. Nobody will see you there. <laughs> Nobody knows you there. And the only lifeline you have, you cut it. This is not normal. You know how people say they did you, you are village people, you know, people <laughs> talk. But it wasn't important. So what I'm trying, what I would say to um, single girls is, 
is Jesus enough? Mm. Is Jesus enough? I mean, like, let's even, is Jesus enough? That's all. If Jesus is enough and you hold him up as enough, then if he, if he wants to add a husband, then let him, that husband is not going to bring him down. You are mm -hmm. not going to compromise him or even mm -hmm. compromise your own standards just so mm -hmm. that you will marry. It's not worth mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Is, and it also goes the same as having children or having whatever you want to have. You yeah. must come back to that question. Is Jesus enough? Mm. And for me, the answer was a yes. He was enough then. He's enough now. Amen. You know, and the beautiful thing is that I met my husband in the same field, very far away from civilization. And everything I desired and plus that I didn't need to compromise the call of God upon my life. Mm, Both of yeah. us now had this, he had made his own sacrifices. So he wasn't making it because of me. I wasn't making it because of him. And if we have built a home today, that is that foundation because yeah. both of us know that we have the call of God upon our lives yeah. and it wasn't dependent on another. So I don't know, have I said anything though? Yes, yes, that's that's just amazing. Uh, and, and I think, like, so none of you had to force the other because each one was called and it's almost like God God had a plan that was better that you didn't even know when he was saying, break up. Yes, crying is part of the human emotions and when you lose somebody that you love, but he was like, I've got a plan that is better. And, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, and... Uh... I, I wonder what would have happened because that guy, he's late today, you know. Oh, no. Yes. And when he died and uh, and the Lord was, and I was like, oh, if I had married him, he wouldn't have died. And the Lord said, no, he would stay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, it's not only that he would have died, you would just have started missions. Oh, yes. You would because you must get back. I mean, if God's hand is on you and you derail to get back to where you were, you must walk that path. Oh my. And at that time, I had done maybe, would I say, almost like 10 years in missions, or you know, like, okay, that was when we came to but I, I don't know, maybe five, maybe about that, you know. So, so, yeah, God has, I, I just want to encourage my single sisters. And I'm talking to Juan right now that don't let anybody make you feel less. Yeah. The whole of life is a challenge. Mm -hmm. Many married people, many insecure married people want you to feel that because I'm married, my life is complete. Many of them are not even enjoying that marriage. Anyone who wants to make you feel less because she's married and you are not is frustrated. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even understand the purpose of marriage. Because if you do, you will respect the single person. You will respect, you will just know yeah. that this is the path God has planned for me for now. You know, yeah. so you're, and this is the path God has planned for this person for now. Yeah. So, you will respect. so anyone who is doing like this, you know, anyone that marriage has now become a class for a arrival has has missed it totally. And so I met such people when I was single. Remember, I didn't marry early, I married at 31. Mm. I met such people, you know, and uh, they look at you. Your life is the life they really want, but they can't have. So they want to sweep you under the carpets, mm. especially especially in Africa, especially where we come from. So yes. just because you are not married now becomes an opportunity to bring you down. And for some people, even then, because um, I was secure, still I'm secure in Christ. Mm -hmm. 
I, I made a lot of fun of those people. You know, mm. marriage is not marriage is not a degree. Mm. Marriage is not what gives you security. Children are not houses, all these things that are not what give you security. What gives you security is Jesus is the center of your life. Yeah. And, and I think that is just so important because I think when we miss the fact that our identity is tied in Christ and he has here, us here on the purpose to fulfill that purpose. Some, some people, part of the purpose is going to include marriage, but some of it, it might not. Or some of it, maybe the timing is at a later. Well, when we miss that, it's easy to settle for less than what God is calling us to and never fulfill his mission for our lives on earth. And then just believe because we are looking for this thing and God is like saying, hey, this is the path. This is, I've got this assignment that is big, that is immense. I want you to impact the lives of people. And we don't do that because we feel insecure and less and never and accomplish you, what is calling us to. You keep feeling when I when yes. I get married, I'll be complete when I. And so, so and uh, you, you are never, it, yeah. no, or, okay, I'll be complete when I do this. No way. Live yeah. right now. Live for, live right now. Yeah. Live the full life right now, you know. <laughs> and so that's what I always say. And, you know, lots of people have gotten to, have brought down their standards, compromised everything just for just for human accolades just mm. so that they can be regarded i remember my younger my own younger sister got remember how early i went to school mm -hmm. so even when i say i married at 31 this is somebody who graduated at 18 19 do you understand you, you yeah. see what they wait yeah so this is someone who has been up you know there doing things so fast and is now getting married, getting married so late. So it was really, even though he did it, it's not, oh, 31, that's not so, it was really so late. Yeah. Because those that went to school with me had all gone to school. So my own younger sister got married before me. And I was really ridiculed, not even by anybody, but by a fellow missionary, you know, mm -hmm. who would say, Oh, come. Uh, no, 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 no. Statuary, please, could you step aside? Uh, this is for married people. And I'm like, wow. my own younger sister. And I'm like, my own younger sister. She said, mm, you know. And I said, okay, you know. So that kind of uh, society wants to make you, wants to make you feel you are less because you are. Yeah. So it, it's up to you. You can decide to get uh, depressed mm. or you can just decide to what jesus yeah. is enough you know there are also times of pressures you know that mm. you know it comes down on you and all but just know that jesus is enough yeah that's awesome thank you you're uh, welcome sir. in the last few well, i don't want to say years but decades we've had a lot more women getting involved in missions it's like the african women of um, dark skin color like us getting involved in missions and uh but i know the number is still not enough yet we need more to arise uh why do you think it's important for women to arise what is our place what role do we have and why should we step up you know um Again, I start with a story. <laughs> <laughs> I I had two sons, two sons, you know, for a long time, 10 years before their sister came. And after, when they were about, they were very young, maybe about three, five or three, four, they began to tell us that they want a sister. And, you know, my husband wouldn't even hear of that because right from the beginning, my husband told me he wants two children, two <laughs> boys, two girls, a boy and a girl, you know, adopted anything, but just two children, you know. And uh, and he had told me even before we got married, if that's not what you want, let's part our ways now. And I was like, oh, you know, but a <laughs> lot <laughs> told me that's not big enough. Who even told you you will have one? You know? uh, uh -huh. so and we went on 
So these children, but do you know my first son, you know him and uh, you know how articulate and calm he always is. So he came, he said to me and the daddy, he said, I need a sister. Aww. And his dad said, you will, yes, your brother will get married, you'll get married and those ladies will become your sisters. So don't worry, you're going to have sisters. He said, no, not that type. I need my own sister. Then he said something. Life will not be easy for anyone who does not have a sister. Oh, wow. You know, they fasted and prayed until this girl came. Wow. Do you know that part of our story? Yes, um, you told okay. me. Yep. Okay. So why am I starting this? Um, the work of God, there's a reason why the woman was created. And it's right from Genesis. She's created to be a help, meet. Mm. So people have, you know, turned it in, they only put it in marriage, your help. No, you are not only, a, the woman is not a help, meet to just a man, just one man. Yes, yes. it happens, but she's the help, meet that God has created for his world. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So my son said, life will not be easy. The work of God cannot move on as smoothly as he desires without the giftings that women bring to the table. Mm. It's unique. And one of those is the flexibility. Yes. The flexibility that you can, you know, it's ingrained in us. One of the things that God taught me before getting married, he said, the, the, the woman was made for the man, not the man for the woman. And what mm. I understood in it is, this is the man. It is the woman that goes right round. It's the woman that finds ways into, do you understand? Mm -hmm. so it's, the, yeah. it's the woman that's, flexible to suit yeah. to conditions you know to to bring out and she does all these many times behind the stage and she's yes. contented she's contented so mm -hmm. that's why so women have done things that they're not even willing to take the credit they're not even talking about it if god brings them to the rostrum to the pulpit beautiful but most of the things we do are behind the scene Yes. And so yes. that's why women of Matthew 6, 33, you know, seeking first the kingdom of God need to arise the more Amen. who are willing to stay under and let God's kingdom blossom Amen. as they nurture, as they do the things that, you know, they are called to do. I think that and then, yeah. And the woman is more likely to be vulnerable. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, and we, those are characteristics that we need in this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh wow, that's wow. Okay, that's amazing. Uh, so, what would you say to the body of Christ? How can the church be more intentional in equipping women, supporting them, uh, whether women who are in church and desiring to maybe get involved in missions, or women who are on the mission field? How can the body of Christ really? become the support for them to make this assignment easy? Um, you know, especially also the single women. You know, what, what I see that breaks my heart is, and I think it's a product of uh, some of this subversive or whatever um, 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 doctrines all over the place where people are suspicious of everybody. What I see declining is community. Mm. Community. Yeah. Like, even when you pull from scriptures, you know, women are better protected in communities. We need to have lively communities. Yeah. You know, so even if a woman, even if a woman was single and she's now getting old, she can become a grandmother to, in the community. Mm -hmm. You know, she can become, can you just welcome these women as your own sisters? Yeah. As your own mothers. Can you just embrace them and welcome them instead of feeling threatened? 
and see that there are people who also embody the grace of God. It's not about them. The grace of God is on them. And also, a note of warning to the sisters, to the women themselves, to not also to feel insecure, mm. but just to come embracing so that they can embrace and be embraced by yeah. others. Let them mm -hmm. let down their guard. But the, 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 there's a community, there's a space that helps you let down your guard. Mm -hmm. Not when you know that not not a place where a man is always after you, uh, always trying to find out you did this, attacking you. You can't let down your guard because yeah. you don't want to commit suicide. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You yeah. you, know, you want to protect yourself because you see mm -hmm. they are after me, and these men do it because they don't even mind that it is their fellow man that is outshining them. But when it's a woman. Mm. you know let them let them go and then you yeah. to the woman let them know that there's nothing in this for me yeah so again it, it, it takes an incubation of the holy spirit it yeah. takes allowing the holy spirit do his work on mm. both you know in us as a church it takes revival mm. you know so that women and their ministries will begin right from the early church. There's been yeah. no move of God that women were not integral to. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen now. So yeah. women will always be there. Mm. Wow, that's that's awesome. I think I just I really like the the part of community and the place of the Holy Spirit and everybody recognizing their place. I know there, there are times when people have said that I'm proud. Because I'm so focused, I'm like, I'm just focused on my assignment. I just want to be faithful to Jesus. I just want to do. But it's, it wraps up on a little uncomfortably for some men when a woman is like, she's going, she's doing the thing that God is calling her to do. And at times it just wraps up around. At times you're like, God, what can I do to help this? I just, I just have, I want to be faithful. That's all. If you don't, if you don't take it rightly, I'm sorry, but. And sometimes intentionally you let down, you let down your hair, you know, you let down yeah. your guard for them, you know, yeah. and how I do that sometimes is, how I do that sometimes is, um, you know, even asking you for help. Mm. I intentionally ask you, can you come and help me do this now, you know, and let you know that I need you as well. Yeah. You know. Let down, tell, I've, I mean, I don't think there's any, well, I've also had that, oh, she's proud. No, so, but God is the one who knows. Yeah. I am driven. I just, I'm, Matthew 6, 33 is my life verse. Yeah. I decide to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness so that all other things or whatever he wants will be added unto me. That's mm -hmm. his part. My part is seeking him first. So if I'm driven and I'm not driven by all these small, small talks, I'm not driven by what color of dress you're wearing, how your hair looks, all those things, you know, and that's what's driving you. And you can pull up. I can't help you, but I'm mm. also not going to, you know, before being younger, I'm like, mm, you know, that's it, you know, but now <laughs> I'm learning that inclusion. Sometimes I also let you, intentionally let you see, oh, it's not all complete for me. Oh. Yeah. Look at what I'm also struggling with. I intentionally let you see. It's unfortunate that that's what makes you feel good. Mm. But if you need to, it's unfortunate. Do you understand? But yeah. if, you need, if you need to, I let you know, you know. So it, it calls for wisdom. It calls for yeah. wisdom. Is a is a it's not a very easy path to work. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so we talked a little about a PhD and all of that. Uh, you have a PhD in mission. So what is the most significant thing that you have learned uh, that would influence how you do ministry from all the education you have received over the years? I know, can, I know it cannot be one because it's several years of education. <laughs> yeah, yes, I've learned um, several things, you know. 
um, in my first year PhD. <laughs> this is interesting. <laughs> you know, they asked us, um, it was a very tough year for me, not because of the academic, but some other dynamics that were not that, you know. Mm -hmm. So my professor, and this was what I think caused the problem. My professor asked everybody, what are you learning? What are you learning? What are you learning? And I said, you know what I'm learning? It was the history of missions. And I said, you know what I'm learning? I'm learning that the people that changed the world did not set out, said, I'm going to change the world. That's what I will do. Mm. But we're just consistent in their disciplines, mm -hmm. in their times with God, you know, staying with God, praying and fasting, things like that. And that's what I saw from the early church fathers. Yeah. They, none of them knew that they were changing the world. They were just doing yes. what, you know. And, and so I said, but look at us. <laughs> That's what I was doing. I said, but look at us. We we are attempting to change the world. We think we will change the world. But I turned to the class. I said, how many of us had our quiet times today? <laughs> Everywhere went silent. Oh, my. Everybody went silent. I said, so that's it. When was the last time you really fasted and stayed before God? Mm, that's it. I said, I, I said, so there's no, that's what we are calling scholars on fire. Mm. You know, scholars on fire. So you're just bringing all this knowledge, all this knowledge, all this, okay, they did this, they did that. How are you putting it into application? What will set it on fire? What altar are you raising mm. that will set these things? And I told them, I said, you see, I don't want to forget this. That for one, I have now seen that everything I've been doing, everything I knew is correct. It's true. It's not zero. It's not out of the ordinary. It's not, oh, she is doing this because she's very zealous. No, yeah. this is the normal Christian life. Yes, yes, yes. I, said, I have now learned that this is the way everyone who served God lived. There's nothing out of the e extra, you know, ordinary, you know? And so how is it not going to just... Uh, stay just like that is that I have to step up you know they say knowledge puffs knowledge puffs mm, yes I have to now step up on my spiritual disciplines yeah I have to I have to because I know so much yes. I'm getting to know so much yeah but how is it not going to be dormant and even cause me harm mm. Is because I need to step up, you know, I need to step up my spiritual disciplines, you know. But another thing I also learned practically now, we come from a group where, you know, we, we actually think, oh, we are the best practitioners of these missions. I mean, if you don't have any connection to us, maybe, I mean. <laughs> You're not um, really doing the work. Uh -huh. So, but I've found out that no, no, um, people, you need to, you need to um, watch and see that the trends are changing. Yes. The movement of God is changing. Mm. You know, what I have learned now equips me to see clearly that change and mm. where I can fitting squarely to do God's work, mm -hmm. you know, effectively. Mm -hmm. Not to also say that I have the language, you know, for communication. I know what yeah. I'm doing. I yeah. can talk before, you know, whoever just depends, yeah. you know. So, but the major thing that came out of all my studies, the major is the exposure. The overwhelming mm. exposure mm. that I have gotten in different areas. I mean, I can't even, I am so grateful to Asbury Theological <laughs> Seminary, to the professors that made themselves available and to mm. everyone. 
So mm -hmm. it's been, mm -hmm. but also to say that the foundation, I'm also very grateful to Capro. The foundation I came in prepared me, helped me, yes. you know, to uh, appropriate the exposure. Yeah. You know, so that I can continue into the one end of my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Awesome. Hey, did you subscribe yet? What are you waiting for? If you haven't, please click the subscribe button, click the notification button so you get notified every time we post a new video. And also share this with someone else. Don't forget to leave us a comment if you haven't. If you have some questions, ask them. We're going to be right in, the, in, that, in that chat box to see what you're saying, to be able to um, hear what your thoughts are. And we are glad you joined this channel. That's how you support us by liking this video, sharing it with someone else, and leaving us a comment. Okay, enjoy the video, and thank you for watching. Um, thank you. Uh Every year we have thousands of students, of people who are coming for jobs, living from different parts of Africa. And many of these people who are coming, they are believers. They are believers in Jesus Christ. And they are coming here either to, to North America or Europe or somewhere. And how can the church prepare them so that when they come to this part of the world. They are effective in their work with Jesus, but effective as people who are here on a mission. Hmm. <laughs> oh, that's a tough one. If I was trying to be controlling, I would have told you not to ask <laughs> that question. I would have told you not to ask that question because you probably not like the answers that I gave. But because oh. we're on camera, we're going to yes. say... And we have to we speak mean. the truth because we want to... Um, just before this call, I was talking to my aunt and um, she had been inviting me to groups, you know, Nigerian groups and stuff. So I finally told her, I said, I can't do it. She's like, what do I mean? I said, no, no, I can deal with um, Nigerian Christians one-on-one -on -one talk, those that I know. Oh, many of them love the Lord, passionate. I said, but many Men, men of this fast growing church don't understand the gospel. And mm -hmm. I they don't understand the gospel. I think that's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say. They yeah. have not understood the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. They are running with all manners of things, but the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is universal, which is the same yes. all over, they yes. are yet to understand it. Yeah, And many of them come in here and you say, what can the church do? Even the person preaching it, you know, our generation, we have redefined the gospel in Nigeria. Oh. We have redefined it. We have, we have pulled it in words. It's now all about us. Yeah. Not only not Nigeria. The okay. So, so, um, so who are you? Which church will prepare you? Mm. What what church is preparing you? Even the church, the general overseer is 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 all a competition. It's all so mm. so many of the people you see coming here. Eh, they might use that word. We are here on a mission. No, they are economic migrants <laughs> that are coming here. They're coming here to actualize themselves. Mm. They're coming here to say, mm -hmm, see me now. And there's no way you will do missions here with yes. that mindset. Yeah. And of course, there are Nigerian churches, there are this, I'm even doing, right now I'm doing a research with some of those immigrant churches, you know. Mm. I'm doing a research with them. What I have seen is that they have transplanted Nigeria into the US. Oh, thank you for saying and, that. And it is not breaking through. That is what yeah. I'm seeing in my interviews. They are a cocoon on themselves. Yeah. The typical American cannot be in those churches. Yes. And they themselves cannot be in the churches of the. So they are cocooned, they are ballooned. Mm. But I I interviewed I inter I interviewed um 
a one pastor. Let me not say his name. Mm -hmm. And he told me something. He said, to survive here and to make impact, I had to audit my theology. Mm. That thing has never left me. I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, we come from a culture where you are looking for, you know, what is in it for me, you know, me, because there's yes. poverty, because there's everything. But you can't make impact here. Yeah. So, of course, we're going to care for the daily needs of people, of our people and all, but that's not the center. Yeah. And, you know, he explained it. All the other pastors that I am, oh, they are just contented with, they are contented with maintaining the Nigerians, the Africans here, they are just contented yeah. with maintaining them here. Oh, they will pray for how they will get green card. They will pray for how they will get this. They will pray for how they will get this. They... And it's, it's no not longer like... about the kingdom. It's no longer it's, about... Is that it's... all there is to okay. life? God has sent us on a mission, a field, a harvest field that is so ripe. And it's like saying, here you are, time to harvest. It's... Is that all there is to life? Many of the so that's why I'm telling you, when you say many of them are Christians, make, they are Christians who are marrying other people just to get green card. Okay. All the people, <laughs> uh, Velma, all the, you see, because can unrighteousness produce righteousness? Mm. All the people you are saying are Christians. Do you know the number of lies they have told to remain in America? Mm. And so uh, we have to look at these things again. Yeah. Because yes. we come with this superiority. Oh, we're very spiritual. We're coming to, no, we're coming to evangelize America. There are no hearts. They don't know how to pray. What are we praying about? Yes. I think that is What it. are the prayer what for? What are we praying about? There's something I want to share, but I don't want to share because I don't want to get into trouble, but I'm going to. <laughs> What are we praying about? Yeah. Is it the kingdom? Or yes. is it about... You see, so, uh, you know, I thought you were even going to ask me, you know, and maybe I should have said it at that point. But mm. the thing is, I let people know I am not an economic migrant. Yeah, I'm, I'm a missionary. That it's girl in baggage field... understand that, like, how would you be in America and you say you're a missionary, like, Exactly. I am a missionary. There are things that I could do if I yes. was an economic migrant. I'm not yes. stupid. I'm not silly. There mm. are things that I could do, but I am not. Yeah. I am a missionary. God's God's hand is upon me like this. Yep. I'm here on a mission. I'm here on a purpose. That is why I'm here. Mm. You know? That is why I'm here. Yeah. And uh, th that girl that was in that, you know, mission field in northern Nigeria, that is still the same reason why he has brought me here. If the location has changed, the means and the end, they have, they are yet, they have not changed and they will not change. Mm -hmm. So when you say, and they're all Christians, I... I question that. I, what is, mm -hmm. Who is a Christian? Who is a Christian, you know? So why is it we have so many big Nigerian churches? Why are they not breaking forth? Yeah. Why are we not having multicultural churches? Because the things that you're saying, hey, let us pray. You are going to have your papers this morning. Jesus' name. <laughs> That's not what the American, the American is like, oh, really? <laughs> okay, you know, you know. Is that what so, I came to church for? Is that what I came to church for, though? You know, yeah. all the enemies in your father's compound. Let <laughs> us pray. We have refused to contextualize the gospel. We have re the gospel to the culture. Yes. We have refused. Yeah, but Instead, you know. In fact, I interviewed a woman who was telling me, don't mind them. They are not zealous. They are not spiritual. They don't want to join. They will say we are loud. We are this. And I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> like, but, you know, I have been in America now for almost 11 years. Mm -hmm. I've met people who are more vibrant than us. 
Yep. Oh and, my. And, and, oh. And they, and they won't utter a word when praying. Ooh. They don't scream. They don't shout. The but they are, they are on fire. The depth. They <laughs> are deep. The young man, Asbury, they are there, littered all over. If you, if you come close to them. Yeah. My pastor now is on whew, fire as hot. He doesn't. So the pride that we think that because mm -hmm. we scream more, we shout more, that yeah. alone, even somebody even has to. And then we carry it. We come from Nigeria. We carry it. We don't contextualize it. We don't don't even. We want to dump it on them. Who does yeah. that? Yeah. And so they leave us. We become a spectacle. They come and they be looking at us. You yeah. say they're not spiritual. They're looking at you. And they are humble. They are looking. They say, hey, is that how to do? <laughs> and then they look at themselves. They say, mm -mm, this is not what I need for my life. And they walk away. But that is the, that's not what God has called us yes. for. Yes. Our message has to reach the typical American. It has to make sense yeah. to them. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. requires a lot of work on our side. Oh, I think that's what we don't want to do. The work that it takes to many and of that's them part, being, a, being, a, being a missionary that's part of being a missionary you have to learn to contextualize but they didn't you are the one who is giving them that title they didn't come here to do missionary they came here to pick dollars so if they have to be called missionaries to pick the dollars it's okay now they will answer it yeah. but that's not their aim and they, yeah. even if they wanted they don't know how to so they begin to recreate Nigerian things. Oh, let's have program. Let's have this. Let's have that. Who are you speaking to? Still the same Nigerian context. So why did you leave Nigeria? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to How go, I'm going to share this. I'm going to share it. I was in Liberia when I was a missionary in Liberia. I was in a, I was attending this church and they had um a twenty one day fast and prayer. I won't say the name of the church. Uh, if it was my local church or another church, but it was a church that they had to one day start fast and prayer. And I decided to join because like you're a missionary, you're alone at times, you just need that community to pray with. And we, we prayed in like, I think it was about the seventh day because we went every morning and evening to pray. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of the prayer, the Lord stopped me because all the prayer was my breakthrough, your new this, your car, the child, the shoes, all the things. And it's like, is that what I sent you? Like, it was in the middle of prayer. It's like, is that what I sent you here for? It's like, Lord, what do you mean? He said, I sent you for the nation. I didn't send you, send you for the things. So if you're fasting and praying, it should be for this nation and the people of the nation. Mm -hmm. And not for us like, okay, God, I'm sorry. And mm -hmm. picked my mm -hmm. bag, headed home, and that was it. And I did, I did several of such things. I was like, whoa. And yeah. and and still doing it here. Sometimes yeah. it's offensive. But but you know, I don't know. We, we just met on this journey. I don't know what your own end is, but I already yes. know my own. Mm -hmm. And our assignments are different. And our so. assignments are different. So I'm not gonna condemn you, mm -hmm. but but I see clearly that. We can come from the same place, but this is not what God is calling me to do. Yeah. And it irritates my spirit. I can't do it. Mm -hmm. So I move on. I can't be doing, I can't be recreating Nigeria in America. I've been called to this nation. I've been to this people here. I can't recreate Nigeria and feel satisfied. No. Yeah. Yeah. So there must be a way that somebody like me with my accent, Mm -hmm. And honestly, there's a way. And honestly, there's a deep impact. This evening, I am talking to people on Zoom, Americans. Mm -hmm. You know? And uh, I have a conference. So there, there are ways. You don't need to be like them. In fact, yep. your message from a, as an outsider even becomes stronger, bolder, yep. mm -hmm. if, you are, if you are in tandem with what God is doing. Yes. A, a, a pastor of a Caucasian church and it's, it's how many years, almost six years now and 
it's been amazing to watch what God is doing. Yes, yes. It takes a lot of work, like you said, but a when lot. you are willing to do the work, then God takes over and does the rest. Yeah. A lot, a lot, a lot of work, spirit, soul, and body. Yeah. Not only, <laughs> of course, and yes, a lot of work, of course, in um, yeah. in 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 studying the word, in praying yeah. and all, but that's just a part of the work. Mm-hmm. It takes a lot of work associating with them yeah and some of and some of us think eh, that one is uh is unspiritual no if they're doing kayaking go and learn how to go as yes go if they're doing what go to the farm go on the combine help with the cattle yes yes because when i lived in baggy field i used to go to the farm did i know it was in that farm that I understood when he said, hey, so I went to sow. And what because in my own culture, how can you be sowing and be throwing away seed? It didn't mm. make until I saw oh, this is what because when they are spraying the rice, that's how they do it. You know, yeah. I went with them everywhere. I made their hair, I made so when you are here, what's head far? But you are not now doing it because you want to take the dollars from them. You know, you want to give them, not to take from them. Because what they're used for is Africans coming and telling them all the Bobo stories, how they have orphanages, mm. how they did this, how they are doing this, how hunger, oh, lies, just so that they can collect their money. So they give you the money and you go. Mm. But now this is not someone that, you're not looking for that. You're looking for the kingdom of God. Yeah. And uh, already with the seminary education, theological education, so is already prepared. Your soul or is already equipped mm -hmm. to know. So it's a holistic reaching out to. And that's yeah. a lot of work. And many of them, one week after they come here, they want to do a program. Do program. Do you know this culture? Have you exegesis, you know, have you exegeted the culture to know what it is all about? Or you think that, ah, look at them. Oh, they don't even know how to fast. Hey, they don't even pray. Do you know do you know their cultural peculiarities? Do you understand them? So it's when you exegete their own culture that you will know where, okay, and the learning is on you, not on them. Mm -hmm. You can't just now, because you are their pastor, you now make it a, a Liberian church. And, you, and if they don't come, you say they're not spiritual. <laughs> That's unfair, you know? Oh, so, my Okay, we are almost wrapping up. So tell us, Baby. what what can the American church, the North American church, the European church learn from uh, the believers from the global south who are coming to these nations? Hmm. I don't know. The, the one thing that you can learn is that our desperation has pushed us to God. Hmm. More reliance on God in the true sense of it. Yeah. More reliance on God because uh, the first thing that happens to my Caucasian brethren, oh, why is the doctor? And there's nothing wrong with that. It's because that's what they have. Maybe mm. also, if we had such services, we would also do so. You mm. know, if they could even like, oh God, even one minute, talk to God. Yeah. Well, what do I do about this thing? You know, more reliance on God than on technology, than mm -hmm. on other things. Yeah. You know, if they can rely more on God, it will do us a word of good. Mm -hmm. And then also, even though we have, you know, said, what are we praying for? All that, all mm -hmm. that. But, you know, um, to be to be bolder as Christians... Mm. to take their stand, you know, um, about 10, 10 and a half years ago in Wilmore, I was taking a walk from coming from the the school back to Kalas where I live. And in the middle of the way, the Lord told me, you know, it's a long, it's a long story, but let me say the one that pertains to here was, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, um, um, okay, now, that his problem with this country is not the president. Then it was Obama. Mm -hmm. It's not the politicians. Mm -hmm. That it is his children who are called by his name. Mm 
but mm. do not walk according to his way. Mm. People who are not strong in the inner man. Yeah. People who are born again, but their inner man is on the fed. Yeah. Their inner man is not strong enough to discern the purpose of God, to walk in it boldly. So they yeah. are sensitive to every other thing but God. Mm. Oh, how will the other person feel? Oh, I don't yeah. have to do this. Oh, I don't. So they don't maintain purity, like purity. Yeah. Some of them can even criticize people. You did this, you did that. But ask them. Yeah. That's your hardship. You know, purity, small, small, in those. Mm -hmm. that's, so, so you know, those are the, the American Christian mm -hmm. Christians, you know, um, there's got to be a revival. Let me just say it that way. Yeah. A revival that will blow the nature of God to our blow faces and cause mm -hmm. us to live according to the path God has chosen. You know, mm -hmm. some of the African brethren, so it's not just African. All, some of the people here in America are also walking in that path, you know. Yeah. But it is not the norm, you know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I want people to understand like, we are not like saying every African who comes here to do ministry doesn't do well. No, that's not what we are saying. But we are saying no. that the, major, the majority, it's easier, not just, it's easier to come and just reach out to, if I want to, if I want to just reach out to Liberians, I wouldn't need a lot of work. But there are times where, as God calls us, we have to cross culture and uh, be willing to make the sacrifice that it takes to see that. And, that and it is tough. It is difficult. Yeah, it is. The more so, natural thing, the more is, natural ah, thing. Some the days you're like, God, God, how long will I? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, because sometimes you are, these are, you see, the thing that maybe because we're even, maybe we're even articulating it because with the missionaries. Yes. Maybe yes. that's why it's even coming as. Mm -hmm. Because most of the people I know, they are not even thinking about that. It just doesn't even occur to them. Like mm -hmm. some of the pastors I interviewed, you know, it doesn't occur to them that they have to contextualize this thing. Like why? Yeah. Let them stay on their own now. We stay on our own. What is it? Honestly, yeah. I one literally said that to me. And I'm mm. like, hmm. You know, yeah. so may, it's a thing to us because we've been missionaries. We have always tried to adjust to other cultures mm -hmm. without judgment and all. But most of the people coming don't have that training and they don't yes. have the humility mm. to learn it. Yeah. And also learning it is awkward. Remember, yes. we have accents. <laughs> Remember, we're not born here. Remember, so learning it is uncomfortable. It's awkward. Mm -hmm. And you would rather continue with your own, you know, but yeah. it won't it won't go too far. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's that's so powerful. And yes, the church, the church here really needs, I think that's the word revival. We need a revival. We need God to just sweep through and uh, and I would say add also like real intentional discipleship, walking with people and Helping because if we have a revival when we don't have solid systems for discipleship, we might get into real trouble. Too. Um, I think all that come together. Yeah, that's true. Because empty vessels cannot fill empty vessels. Again. Cannot fill empty vessels. Yeah, that's things are happening. People, there's no time. You know, you know, discipleship. Yeah, I don't know what your experience was. You know, <laughs> it takes a lot of time and intentionality. It takes a lot. <laughs> It, it takes people, the discipleship I see here, and I'm not condemning it, it's okay. Let's mm. pick a book and read. Yes. Oh, my. You know, it's it's much more than that now. It's more than that. It's inviting you into my kitchen. Yes. It's doing life with you. Who has yeah. that time? Yeah. So we have to create that time. Yeah. Mm. And we have to create that heart. Yeah. Because, of course, it's the person that you have called into your house that will know that you have dirty dishes, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And that's part of the process. Where there's, there has to be some vulnerability, that's part of, of the process. Of course, of course. So. And that can become 
what the issue, not even what you are now telling the person. Yeah. Can you imagine? Oh, her place is so, her, you know. And so people are like, I don't want problems. But yeah. again, that also means that we have to, there, there won't be there won't be skeletons in our cupboards. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, yeah. And even if somebody found what they thought was a skeleton, it means nothing to you. Mm -hmm. So, and you just gonna need to live your life. Yeah. You know, so so um I'm not just saying this thing theoretically. Somehow, mm -hmm. this is the life God has brought us here in Dayton, Ohio. We yeah. work with the homeless and the poor. And God mm -hmm. is giving us those privileges of mm -hmm. you know opening our lives again. That's the only way we have discipled. Opening yeah. our lives, opening our homes, opening everything. And yeah. it's up to you. It's up to you. And I know that God will continue to bring people who need what he has put in us. Yeah. Amen. 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 So any last words? Um, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Let's keep our let's keep our focus clear. Mm. Let's um let's not allow for distractions. Yeah. My theme this year is listening to the voice of God, and it has been tried. This is still mm. the first week or something of the second month, but it has been tried over and over again. There's a lot mm. of noise outside. Most of that noise, most of that noise is opposite the voice of God. Mm. So what does it take to hear the voice of God clearly? That's yeah. what we must be pursuing, you know, mm. and uh, let's leave distractions, worries. It's not easy. Mm. You know, life generally is not easy. You, 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 mm. you, you, you need more money than you have right now. You need more this than you have right now. You need more this than you have right now. But if we can pursue more of God, more, mm. of, more of God, he will make sure that when the time comes, whatever it, the need is, he's yeah. going to do it. He will Amen. It. So Amen. may the Lord help us. May the Lord grant Amen. us grace. Um, Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Oh, man, sis, thank you mm -hmm. so, so much. This has been amazing. And for everyone who is watching, thank you all for watching. Uh, leave us a comment behind. Give us a feedback. Uh, let us know how this video blessed you and share it with somebody else. And uh, we are going to stay in touch. Okay, bye. Ciao.